Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again. Today we'll be discussing Nuestra Familia General Robert Babo Sosa. Although he was a Puerto Rican and lived in cities now considered Southern or Mexican Mafia territory, he joined the Nuestra Familia and ushered in a reign of terror with an untold number of murders conducted under his leadership. But before we begin, a quick word from our sponsor. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. Robert Rio Sosa was born on February the 20th, 1945 in Santa Barbara to parents Julio and Gloria Sosa. Babo was born and raised in Santa Barbara. Here he is in his 1959 Santa Barbara Junior High School 8th grade yearbook picture. Babo also enjoyed playing basketball and this picture is taken from the same 1959 yearbook featuring the school's basketball team. As he grew up, Bobo became interested in cars, and this would lead to run-ins with law enforcement. On September the 27th, 1963, Bobo's hometown newspaper reported that he was fined $3 in the local traffic court for having a modified exhaust system on his vehicle. Bobo's love for cars was inherited from his dad, Julio Sosa Sr. His father owned an auto body shop named Julio's Custom Shop. As you can see from the Santa Barbara directory, both Bobo and his younger brother, Julio, worked at their father's shop. To clarify, Bobo's younger brother was named after their father, so he was Julio Rio Sosa Jr., known as Buggy Sosa. By 1965, Bobo's license had been suspended but this didn't stop him from cruising in his vehicle. On February the 23rd, 1965, his hometown newspaper reported again of his involvement with the local traffic court. Bobo was fined $110 and given 90 days in jail for driving on a suspended license. His involvement with law enforcement would not only continue, but the repercussions would become more serious. On June 19th, 1965, Bobo, his older brother John Sosa, and his younger brother Buggy Sosa were arrested for the burglary of Victor's Grocery Store located on 535 East De La Guerra Street. Unfortunately for Bobo and Buggy, they not only love cars, but they also love shooting black. This love claimed Buggy's life when he died of an overdose on February the 8th, 1997, in San Diego, California. The love of the carga will also lead to Bobo and Buggy's commitment to the California Department of Corrections. On September the 14th, 1966, Bobo was arrested again on suspicion of burglary. He was arrested by police and sheriff's officers and charged with burglary at the home of Dr. Robert S. Poos. Under questioning, Bobo confessed to committing 13 burglaries in the Santa Barbara area. He would go on to be convicted of this crime spree and was sent to the CDC. But before we continue, I would like to point out there are some narratives floating around out there that Bobo was a Vietnam veteran. But as we can see after reviewing his history, he was not. Bobo began his career behind the walls in late 1966 or early 1967 at Soledad Prison. Let's briefly discuss the prison dynamics in play at the time of Bobo's entry into the system. In 1957, at the Dual Vocational Institution, Weddle Buff began to implement his idea of a gang of gangs. His vision was to bring together the cream of the crop of the Mexican gang underworld as carnales or brothers, instead of fighting amongst themselves as the street gang rivalries dictated. The newly formed gang then leveraged their power base to take what they wanted and enjoy the small creature comforts, both illegal and legal, available in prison so they could do easy time. As the Mexican Mafia matured, they sought to take over all the rackets in prison, formalized their code of conduct or reglas, complete with death oaths, and became the power behind the walls. The Mexican Mafia's rise to power didn't go unnoticed. In 1965, a second group of Chicanos, also predominantly from Southern California cities, came together at Soledad Prison to form the second prison gang in the California Department of Corrections history. The common narrative is that the Nuestra Familia Mexicana, as the gang was originally named, was formed as a protection against the Mafia's predatory practices. This for sure played a role 
as they recognized that the Emme was an equal opportunity exploiter. But the founders also wanted to replicate the Mariposa success of generating money from the yard. These men wanted their issue tambien. The founders are recognized to be John Little John Valdez from Little Valley, Freddy Gonzalez from San Diego, and Gonzalo Chalo Hernandez from Bakersfield. The first constitution or organizational structure is referred to as the Padre System, which was a vertically integrated organizational structure utilizing family member titles for positions of rank versus the second constitution that was also a vertically integrated organizational structure arranged along military lines. Little John was the first boss or padre of the new prison gang. It was only a matter of time before the Nuestra Familia and the Mexican Mafia came into conflict, and this took place in the Shoe War of 1968 at San Quentin. As we discussed in the recent episode featuring Huero Buff Flores, some of the Emma's earliest victims were fellow Chicanos. Three separate attacks on fellow Chicanos by the Mafia led to the outbreak of hostilities between the two groups. On February the 4th, 1968, James Sonny Peña from Eloyo Maravilla was stabbed to death on San Quentin's upper yard, suffering three wounds to the chest with one piercing his heart. Peña was engaged in the drug business and had not lived up to his commitment with the Emmet. The hit was assigned to Robert Robot Salas from Big Hazard and Frankie Chivo Buena from Merced. He was later to be known as Frankie B from Primera Flats. Robot, a newly made member, made his bones on this assignment. This murder led to some Maravilla convicts joining a common cause with the Nuestra Familia against their common threat, the M. Most notable of these was former Mexican Mafia member Luis Arajo, who was also from Elo Maravilla and was Sonny Peña's fellow homeboy. This murder was followed up by an attack on March the 2nd, 1968. Philip Rebel Neri from Bakers and fellow homeboy of Nuestra Familia co-founder Chalo Hernandez was attacked on the San Quentin Yard by M. Prospect Richard Mosca Solis and Pedro Bogus Pete Nunez. Neri was stabbed in the back and abdomen and nearly died. Steve Calote Amador from Wilmas called the hit because Neri was overheard making disparaging remarks about the Mexican Mafia. This murder assignment was given to Mosca Solis as the prize for his entry into the Emmet. On Saturday, September the 14th, 1968, Robot Salas appeared on the San Quentin yard while wearing some newly acquired shoes he received from his Emmett brother and street crime partner, Carlos Pieface Ortega from Garrity. Pieface stole the shoes from Hector Mad Dog Padilla from San Jose. Mad Dog confronted Robot and demanded his shoes back, or else he would meet Robot on the yard the next day, ready to get down. Robot didn't wait. On the next unlock, Robot entered Mad Dog Sal and began stabbing him. Mad Dog Sally, Manuel Menito Romero from Eloy Maravilla, saved his life by coming to his assistance and was stabbed by Robot for his good deed. Robot's attack on Mad Dog and Menito was the straw that broke the camel's back. The Nuestra Familia planned to move on the Mexican Mafia the following day. On Sunday, September the 15th, 1968, a series of attacks on the four remaining Mexican Mafia members in the general population took place. Those who remained on the line were Ramon Ponchi Amado, Howard Capi Pacini, Manuel Tati Torres, and Ruben Sapo Valdez. Eight convicts suffered injuries and one was murdered. The single murder took place in South Block's D section as the attacks began to unfold on September the 15th, 1968. Guards locked a large group of convicts in D section to keep them from joining the attacks. Some of these convicts gathered at the steel door trying to get a glimpse of the ongoing incidents. Archie Cricket Gallegos from Diamond Street, a Mexican Mafia sympathizer, voiced his opinion that the Nuestra Familia were cowards for attacking the Mexican Mafia when most of them had been locked up, instead of confronting them when they were heavy on the yard. Three familianos were also present and had been prevented in participating in the attacks when alert guards locked down D section. Those present were Babo Sosa, Thomas Pollo Montoya from San Jose, 
and Martin Marty Aguero from Oakland. They overheard Cricket's comments and pounced on him. Boyo and Marty held Cricket while Bobble stabbed him with a half pair of eight and a half inch black handled scissors. These were later recovered in a cell used as a common toilet for convicts in D section. Officer Leo G. Davis sounded the alarm at about 2 p.m. when he came across Cricket lying on his back holding the left side of his chest covered in blood. Officer Moore observed Marty give Poyo a clean pair of pants and shirt. They were apprehended while Poyo was trying to change. A bloody shirt was found under the bench that Poyo was sitting on. A subsequent body search also revealed that Poyo had a stab wound in his leg. He was taken to the hospital and Marty was placed in segregation. Babo, on the other hand, escaped undetected. The Nuestra Familia took control of San Quentin and the Mexican Mafia was not allowed to walk the line at the Big Q. We now know from Sergeant Hankins' autobiography, Alpha Guard, that Chalo Hernandez, Freddy Gonzalez, and Jesse Black Jess Gonzalez collaborated with them to identify and keep the Mexican Mafia members locked up and off the yard. To be clear, there is no evidence that Bobo was also collaborating with Sergeant Hankins. To the contrary, I am sure had Bobo been made aware of the three NF snitches, he would have been the first to move on them. Bobo's status was riding high, having committed the only murder in the familia's confrontation with the dreaded Mexican mafia. This would propel him to the top of the gang when it was reorganized under the second constitution in 1973. Abundio Padilla, a Nuestra Familia defector, testified that he met Death Row Joe Gonzalez from Oxnard in San Quentin in 1972. Furthermore, he said that Death Row Joe and another member named Robert Daira Medina from Samper were drafting a new constitution complete with bylaws to reorganize the NF. After the murder of Cheyenne Cadena in Palm Hall, on December the 17th, 1972, Frank Joker Mendoza from Redondo, Juan Manzanas Colón from New York, and NF associate Raymond Tiny Contreras were indicted and being tried for Cheyenne's murder. They subpoenaed members to Palm Hall to discuss the new constitution. According to Padilla, those members were Daira Medina, Death Row Joe, Manuel Bozo Torres, and Babo Sosa. Death Row Joe was said to have offered Babo the position of Nuestro General. Death Row Joe was then appointed by Bobo as first captain, and Daira Medina was appointed as second captain. The first order of business under the new constitution was to create a hit list. After the lopsided result of the 1972 war against the Mexican Mafia, they planned on identifying the dead weight in the familia for execution, thus putting fear in the membership and strengthening the organization as a whole. Babo issued hits on three familianos he considered to be traitors. They were Michael Fat Mike Rodriguez, Manuel Manito Garza, and Michael Pollo Cuna. But let's listen to Daira Medina regarding the murders that were planned after the reorganization of the Nuestra Familia. After you drew up the Constitution, you were going to carry out executions. Yes. Why? For, uh, it was supposed to be as an example for the rest of the members, for those that didn't want to move against the enemy, and uh, as to what would happen to them. They felt that it had to be carried out in order to unite the organization more. How many executions did you plan? It was about 10. 10 names came down, about 10 names. However, only uh, four were carried out. But you made four of the 10 hits? Yes. Michael Fat Mike Rodriguez was marked for execution for cowardice. According to Fig Avilio's autobiography, The Last General Standing, Fat Mike and three other familianos were housed in a dorm at Susanville. On October the 4th, 1972, Fat Mike was assigned to watch the door leading into the dorm for any approaching enemies or trouble. He observed two medals approaching and instead of warning the others, he ran away. Doroteo Sleepy Bentoncourt from Calexico and Eddie Pelon Moreno from Norwalk were both experienced killers and entered the dorm and killed NF members Frank Diamond Miranda and Richard Bullwinkle. Fat Mike was murdered by fellow familianos 
Fernando Sapo Yanez and Robert Pajaro Rocha on August the 25th, 1973 at DVI. The next member to be hit was Manuel Manito Garza. He was stabbed by Frank Chito Sanchez but survived. NF member Michael Pollo Cuna from Salinas was moved on next by Michael Pinas Villasana and William Oso Romo. He too survived the attack, minus one eye. All three hits took place on August the 25th, 1973 at DVI. Babo and Death Row Joe instituted a reign of terror ordering an untold number of murders and assaults. In my personal estimation, this was the zenith or high watermark of the Nuestra Familia. But all the murders would also contribute to the downfall of Babo Sosa, Death Row Joe, and the Familia itself. They would recover and build back up, but never equaling their past power. This video is getting a little long, so we better end it here. We'll pick up Babo's story in another video, but for now, good night and God bless.